So, uh, I would like to start today's talk with a quotation from a blog called The Weekly Grant. Here we go. Okay, why is it that people are no longer capable of sitting in a cinema for the length of a movie, even a relatively short one, uh, and keeping their mouths shut? I refuse to go to my local flea pit as I am always surrounded by morons who think that they are sitting in their own living room and proceed to talk all the way through the entire movie. Now that sounds horrible, right? Okay, so if I can get a quick show of hands, who here is more or less on board with the notion that you keep your mouth shut with, in a movie theater? Okay, so okay, I might change your mind a little bit, but most of us are still not going to go out and just go start talking through the new Star Wars movie when it comes out. Um, but let's let I, I hope you'll agree with me at least a little bit that there isn't there something kind of you know transgressively fun about sitting down and doing it in your own living room? Who among us hasn't had a friend over to watch some? Movie and make jokes about how stupid it is. How else do we explain? Uh, how else do we explain the Sharknado? <laughs> uh, we don't watch these movies because they are, eh, they are aesthetically or narratively pleasing. We watch them because they're stupid and they invite us to laugh at them. Okay? So, but like I said, we don't do it in a movie theater. We don't do it during a live performance. And you students out there certainly shouldn't do it in class because your, your professor most likely has some policy built into the class where you talk about it, you're going to suffer some kind of penalty. Okay? So why should we have such things? Why should we care? Can anyone ask a quick answer in one or two sentences? Why do we not talk in a theater? Out of respect for everybody else who probably hasn't seen it. There's something to be seen there that, that talking gets in the way of. You're right about that. Okay? So, and so think about this. You go to a theater, you plop down your $10 or whatever a movie costs nowadays, and you are here for an experience. It is a prepackaged experience that the text producers, the fine folks at Sharknado, or at Lucas, <coughs> whatever you go to see, they have a particular experience in mind for you, and you have come for that experience as they intended, because they always know best for us. Okay? Uh, I'd like to, 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 to think about things a little bit differently today. Because this is serious business. Uh, we know you don't talk in a movie theater. And it's not just you know that someone's going to shush you. Uh, there have been experiences of people being shot in a movie theater for talking. There have been experiences of people being stabbed in a movie theater for complaining about somebody talking. So it's a big deal. It's something that we take seriously. But let's think about it in different ways. Because while some of us, most of us, if not all of us, are going to see talking in a movie theater as an antisocial, a, a travesty of bad manners, uh, supreme rudeness and self-centeredness. When I see people talking in a movie theater, I see an amazing array, a constellation, if you will, of different voices, <coughs> perspectives, and ideas. And they're coming together, and they're bouncing off each other. And they're changing the way I understand not only the text on the screen in the movie, but also how I understand other movies. The very notion of going to a movie theater, it changes the way I understand them. And I hope that my talk today, that you understand them a little bit differently, even if you decide you're not going to go out and start doing it yourself. Okay. So a little bit, uh, kind of a roadmap of what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of embodied audiencing, uh, more rich than you probably realize, unless you're a theater historian. I'm going to talk about movie riffing and embodied audiencing today. Um, some of the things I've been researching, and I'm going to talk some theoretical implications. So what does it mean to us in the academy? What does it mean to us um, who are just interested in film and pop culture in general? Okay, so let's start by talking about embodied participatory audiences in a historical context, specifically with live the end. Okay, so most of us, if not all of us, have grown up in a world where uh, talking during against the movies is either against is either bad or we're gonna do it but we know it's bad. We know what the expectations are. You sit down, you shut up, and you don't get in people's way, you don't talk. Okay? Um, but this is actually a, just a relative blip in the history of, of theater. Uh, because for a long, long time, longer than any of us have been here, uh, theater was a raucous shared experience. Okay, so let's go all the way back to that Shakespeare guy you might have heard a little something about. Um, this is uh, the Globe Theater as depicted in the movie Shakespeare in Love. Obviously, we don't have any photography from, uh, from Shakespeare's era. But uh, you may be familiar with the term the groundlings if you take any theater class. 
So if you can see up here, these folks up here in the in the galleries, in the covered gallery, that would have been your rich people. That would have been the cultured people, the beautiful people. But these people down here on the floor, the groundlings, these are the poor people. These are the working men and the working uh, women. And they are, they are loud, they are raucous, they are sweaty, they are shouting, they are heckling the, the stage. Uh, that sounds horrible to us today, but that was how theater was, was done back then. Uh, I'm, I'm citing a, a theater historian named Amanda Mabillard here. Um, she writes that um, they would have been just as interested in what was going on off the stage as on it. You've got people here who are engaging in pickpocketing, in gambling, in fighting, in prostitution, uh, things like that of the day, right in front of the stage while the play is going on. They were so pervasive that actually Shakespeare talked about them directly in at least two of his plays. Hamlet, and I forget what the second was, I want to say one, one to Henry the Fourth. Uh, but he directly addressed uh, the audience. Um, and so that was very different from what we understood. So this is moving forward into, we're in uh, kind of 17th, 18th century pre-revolution uh, France, okay? So this is during an age when theater would have been directly tied to, to the royals. You weren't allowed to, uh, to do any theater that, that, the, that the, the king and queen didn't approve of. Uh, they would have had direct control over what was happening. So again, you've got the rich people in covered galleries here, but you've got poor people down here on the floor. We call those the parterre audiences, meaning on the floor. Uh, so much like the groundlings, they were boisterous, they were loud, uh, they uh, were booing and hissing and fighting and engaging in neighborhood quarrels while the, while the thing was going on here on the stage. The difference here, or at least a, a one difference, is that they exerted a direct influence over what was going on on the stage. If they didn't like the show, they shouted the show down and the show would stop or the show would, would stop running. That is a remarkable power grab in an era where if you spoke back to the king and queen the way they spoke in that theater, off your head, but uh, they exerted direct control <coughs> over royal matters here. It was explicitly political. Uh, imagine going to a movie theater and saying, I hate this movie, play something else. And they would in that regard. They would, they would either do a different show or they would stop doing that show and do a show to appease the people in the audience. That's power. So uh, very interesting stuff here. Uh, the next one, this is a term I bet a lot of you have heard, uh, the peanut gallery. Uh, this comes from turn of the century vaudeville. Uh, instead of being on the floor, the the poor people would have been sitting up in the balconies, um, more in mass than than Waldorf and Statler from Muppet Show here. But they were heckling the show, they were booing, they were hissing, they were. Um, the term peanut gallery comes from peanuts were the snack of the poor people, so they would throw peanuts at the stage if they didn't like what was going on. Uh, so again direct influence and a power clash because this is the late Victorian era. You weren't supposed to be doing stuff like that in public, a very prim, conservative time. And yet there were audience members uh, clashing directly with the police who said, stop doing that. They continued to find ways to do it. So if you're interested in power clashes and how uh, poor people and, and disadvantaged people uh, react to the state and state power, this is this this hopefully is interesting to you. Okay. So we're going to move up into the 20th and 21st century here. And at this point, yeah, movie theaters and live, live performance has become a still and silent thing. So the, much closer to what you know of is today. But yet audience members still find a way to, to change things, to lash out. Okay. So we're going to move into a couple specific eras uh, and activities here that I've done some research on. So the first place I want to go is what I'm going to call embodied audience enrichment. So this is where people are up in the theater, they're moving around, they're dancing, they're singing, they're chanting, they're throwing stuff. Anybody ever been to a show like that? I know I know some of our instructors have. Any examples, Dr. Sharks? Rocky Horror Picture Show. Never heard of it. <laughs> the Rocky Horror Picture Show, 1975. First, it's a, it's a pretty successful, um, pretty successful musical adapted into a failed movie. Not a popular movie, not received well. Um, but theater managers noticed that, hey, well, this movie isn't doing a lot of money. The same people keep coming back time and time again. And they're having fun. They love it. So all of a sudden, out of this continual exposure and love of this bizarre text, uh, they develop a ritual. 
Um, it starts with jokes. Uh, excuse my language here. But um, one of the first jokes that's recorded is in a theater, uh, Greenwich Village, um, is where this kind of evolves. Um, there's a scene where Janet, the, the, the woman protagonist from the movie, gets caught in a rainstorm because so she puts a, a newspaper over her head. So this mild-mannered school teacher out of nowhere says, buy an umbrella, you cheap bitch. So that's not exactly a, a super funny thing. It's not the funniest thing I've ever said in my life. But notice here, it, it, it's a reaction to the film. It's a comment on the film that it can't be, I can't be understood outside of. You wouldn't just say that on the street. But in the, in the context of, of a film and what we expect of a film, we expect our characters to have prompts and things like that. So it evolves from there. People are doing their own jokes. And pretty soon they're bringing props. People start bringing their own newspapers to put over their head. The movie starts in the wedding. So people throw rice up in the air. Um, Dr. Frankenfurter, uh, here, Tim, our wonderful Tim Curry, proposes a toast. So people throw toast in the air. Um, yep. Notice here, there's a direct signification to the film. It's not just a random comment. It's specifically a response to what's going on at the stage. And it, that ridicule helps us understand the text in a different way. Um, we don't understand it as an earnest movie. We understand it as a joke, as a farce. Uh, which is probably what the film was intended as. But this is different. It was not intended as to, to engender um, embodied performance. So a ritual evolved, and now you can download the whole script, and you can perform with this yourself. In fact, if we don't if, if we don't offer this in Halloween in the student center, we really really should. So see it if, see it if we can. But like I said, this has been in, this is in its fifth active de do, uh, decade of duty. We've seen it; it's been written about. So I don't write much about this. I'm more interested in kind of its 21st uh, century uh, um, follower of the room. So did anyone have, anyone seen the room? One, yes. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Stars, you were just from Giant Rock. So, The Room, much like Rocky Horror, is a failed uh, 2003 melodrama. Uh, it is made almost exclusively by this wonderful man here, uh, Tommy Wiseau. Uh, he is the star, he's the writer, he's the director, he's the producer, he raises the money for it, and he markets it as well. So, this, this guy is made. Um, and on its surface, it's a fairly standard melodramatic love train. This is Johnny, he's our star, he's a banker, he loves his fiance, she's cheating on him with his best friend, Mark. Uh, he eventually finds out about it. There's a climactic birthday party in which he declares that he's been betrayed and he shoots himself, but don't be all that bad about that. That's the movie, okay? So that sounds like a movie that you could see any day. Uh, but that's really only the first 10 and the last 10 minutes of the movie. The middle 70, of minutes is just a bizarre, wonderful cavalcade of weird characters and scenes that go nowhere and plot cul-de-sacs and strange dialogue. Um, it's it's made it's nothing like a traditional film, even though it has the skeleton of a traditional film. So this movie flops horribly when it comes out. It makes like five thousand dollars when it first comes out. That's not much at all for a movie that costs six million. Uh, but uh, but people keep going to see it in Hollywood. I mean, it gets like celebrity fans like Pat Oswalt and uh, Paul Rudd and people like that. They're saying, "Go see this movie. It's really weird." Um, and then a ritual develops. And then Tommy Wiseau says, "I can cash in on this." So he starts going to showings and like people ask him questions and they make jokes at him and he makes jokes back. And so there's this really interesting cult audience thing going on here, where all of a sudden this movie that is we understand it in a completely different way. So here's some, uh, a short clip I'm going to show you here from a 2010 version screening in St. Louis. I was not there for this particular screening, but I have seen it at this theater. So you're going to see here, and can I get the lights? Would anyone, is it possible it's to get the lights? Oh, I do. I'm so, none of my classrooms have lights, so I'm just going to have to ask people to do this. This is wonderful. Okay. So um, I'm going to show a brief clip here. There may, okay, so. Uh, quick hint, there may be a little bit of brief nudity here. It's not like full frontal, but there are uh, four soft core sex scenes in this strange movie, three in the first 25 minutes. Uh, I'm going to try to skip around those, uh, but they are unpleasant to watch. So keep around your people doing stuff that you wouldn't do in a normal theater. Go.
Directed himself into a corner here. Ah, uh, you can see the string. Oh. I think these scenes are from a completely different movie. Maybe, but they right work so well. What's in here, Danny? They quit hitting your hand. Bend it to you. Dress casual. Steve, you are firm. Hey, one of these times I might actually hit you. 
Well, all right. Okay. You win. I'm in love with you. Well, all right. It's kind of a low impact Donnie book. The four seasons are watching. <laughs> Hey, ride the wild guy! What about sense? <laughs> this face really never came together. <laughs> Whee! Raw power of a casual slap. And Ann Miller looks on. <laughs> this town really did need porn. I'm trying to recreate the Burt Lancaster Deborah Carr thing here for. Breaks just like a little what? Mm -hmm. This looks like a job for Zimmerman! Woo! And they're commenting there that that guy kind of looks like young Bob Dylan. If you didn't catch that joke. Yeah. If you know who Bob Dylan is. <laughs> so, okay, so now there, like I said, there are like several hundred jokes to analyze in there. So what I've done is kind of trying to figure out kind of how does this show work? There's a lot written about the show and kind of what this ripping thing in general, but how do the individual jokes work? You have to watch them all in the context and understand how each one of them is subtly changing the way that we understand the text. And they have lots of cool things that they've done there. Um, I wish I had time to share them all with you, um, but we've got to keep moving. Okay. And for those of you, I'll touch briefly on a third place I go, for those of you who love the idea of being up out of your chair and the idea of making verbal jokes like this, you owe it to yourself to be at uh, to be at B Fest, the last weekend of every January at Northwestern University. It's a 24 hour bad movie festival where people are up all night and all the next day making fun of cheesy movies, kind of like the ones you saw there. So, many hundreds, if not thousands of clusters of individual acts there to check out there. So, I love it, I'll be there. I'm, I'm working on I've got a lot of projects going there. Okay. So, what are the implications of all this? Why, as scholars, as students, as teachers, should we care about this stuff? Um, why should I spend lots and lots of hours writing about it? And uh, when I could be writing about something valuable, right? So that's you were kind of like in that pop culture study stuff. It's not for me. So let me tell you a little bit about the theoretical implications here. Okay. So let's just start by breaking down what what is this word riff? I've mean, used that term a couple times. What is it to riff something? So for those of you who know some music theory, it comes out of the jazz tradition. Um, it means to play a piece of music in a wild, unbridled, creative style that is both indebted to the original text, to the meaning that it's understood as, as another song, but it's played in such a way that it's also an independent thing. It's also a, a, a unique thing. So this jazz metaphor is really interesting to me because um, it shows us that riffing is simultaneously enabled by the creative powers of the musician, but it is also constrained. If you don't have the chops, if you don't have the vocabulary, the tools, you cannot engage in the creativity like you saw on the screen. Because this is the thing, even though we're riffing at the screen, it is for the audience. When I'm talking in the theater, or when I'm talking, um, when I'm engaging in, in embodied performance, it is for you. It is for my fellow audience members. It has a message that I'm asking you to accept. It's an explicitly political act. I don't mean political Republicans and Democrats necessarily, but you could go that direction. What I mean by political is a few things. Number one, it is always loaded with with values and attitudes and beliefs. Meaning everything you saw there, it had a message. It wasn't neutral, it wasn't necessary, it wasn't natural, it was somebody's ideology. It speaks to larger issues. So we're not just talking about the sinister urge or the room of Rocky Horror. We are talking about larger issues, cultural issues, issues of cinema, issues of art, issues of politics. Uh, any one of those is saying something larger than just in that moment. And then number three, it calls on the audience to accept that worldview. So if I say, this movie sucks, that's not a, a profound statement, but I'm asking you to, to attach the stigma of suck, whatever that means to you, to this film. You can accept that or you can reject that. Um, so, so there's a lot more going on there than just like, yeah, yes, yes it's good, yes it's bad. You're, you're always undertaking this, this work of reading. Because Reading a text, like a film or a TV show, is really, really hard and complicated. Um, it's not something that just happens. We've been arguing about what we might call audience agency. How much power do we have to make sense of what we're seeing here? We've been arguing about that for a long, long time. Um, back in the earliest discourses about film and media, we gave the audience very little credit to make sense of what was going on. So 
So here's an example. This is a 1895 CW Strangers are to the arrival on a train in a station. A the Lumiere Brothers film. Very early uh, idea of cinema variant. So watch this. This was shown in uh, French uh, Club Two French theater patrons at the time, remember this is very early, were not smart enough to know that this was a film. They thought, oh my god, this train is coming into my into my house, or in the coffee house, I'm going to scream and run. So that's kind of the the early allegory for, you know, film audiences just aren't that smart. You can just take a to whatever you want. Now Tom Gunning, who studies early theater, he says, eh, I don't think so. I think they were kind of suspending their disbelief. Much like you go into a horror movie and scream, but you know you're not really in it. So they were playing along with the experience. They weren't that stupid. Uh, but the stigma of movie audience as overwhelmed kind of remains. Um, if you've ever heard, if you've done any work in, in uh, the critical field, you may know the Frankfurt School. So it's some scholar, uh, early critical theaters coming out of like the 1930s, kind of around that era. Um, kind of what, what coalesces uh, their, their mission is they were readers of Karl Marx, who projected that, uh, he predicted that capitalism was going to fall and the workers' revolution was going to rise up. And all the stuff basically that Marx predicted was going to happen was true, and yet capitalism did not fall. And it still happened, of course. Uh, so they were trying to figure out, okay, what's going on here? Why, what happened that, that capitalism did not fall? And one of the things they noticed is that this is about the time of the Nazi rise of the Nazis. They noticed that these Nazis, by gosh, they are really, really good with mass culture. You know, the, like their, their rallies, their videos, their propaganda is amazing. And so they kind of theorize, well, that, this mass culture may have something to do with it. So they come up with this theory of what we call the culture industry, which is that more or less mass media produced, is produced by people in power to keep people, to keep power, to keep masses subjugated. Which is why, you know, if you think about the kind of movies you'll see in a the theater, they all kind of have the same method. They're all, they all generally are going to show a particular worldview. And there are exceptions. But most of them have a particular message, which we'll get to here in just a minute. So toward the end of the 20th century and into the 21st century, we start giving people more credit. They are able to, we say that people can not only understand movies, they can make them into something for themselves. So this is Henry Jenkins. Uh, he theorizes on participatory culture, like people re-editing cultures, writing fan fiction, make, excuse me, making new videos that change the way we understand the old ones. So I'll give you a good example. Star Wars fans in the house. Um, you're a big Jar Jar Binks fan, I bet. So Jar Jar Binks is an extremely unpopular character from Star Wars, a fan of Menace. Uh, a lot of people didn't like him, so you know what? Somebody just cut him out, and they made a new cut of the video that had almost no Jar Jar. So that's an example of changing a movie for our own purposes. So we can do this, uh, according to the cultural, cultural studies scholar. But here's the thing. Only insofar as we are able to make sense of it, because um, so I'm going off of a theater named Stuart Hall here. Most movies, most television shows, enact a particular worldview. So here are some things that, that we know. That we know. Um, TV and movies, they generally promote a, a worldview that is that promotes individualism, self-reliance and distrust of government, capitalism and social Darwinism, patriarchy and racism. So if you are somebody who um, is a white, masculine, uh, straight, middle-class, Judeo-Christian man in power, guess what? You get to see yourself on TV like every night, like in every show. It's very easy to find to see that your worldview gets reified because you're always the hero. You're always the good guy. Um, people who do not fit that, that, uh, that description, uh, you have to work a little bit harder to, find, to see pictures of yourself. Um, as we talked about in some of my con classes, like where are, you know, you know, where are the Hindu people? Like, can anyone name an example of a Hindu character on TV? Sorry, you're stuck with, with Mike Myers, the love guru. That's the only image of that particular group that gets to be represented. And it's not a pretty, it's not a pretty thing. Um, who do you see uh, black men on TV? They play two roles. They're athletes or they're criminals. That's all. We used to have Bill Cosby, but we don't have Bill Cosby. <laughs> uh, you know, um, so we only have very limited issue, images of, of people who don't fit this this you know this mythical norm, as Audrey Lorde would call it. Uh, but um, these people then have to go work harder. They have to be able to read text in ways of taking them apart. 
And that, my friends, if I could bring it home here, is why I love this riffing stuff. Because by following how people do this, when they're making this meaning making process out loud, they're doing it right in front of our faces and they're interpreting it as the happening, we can see how they're making sense of it. We can see their sense making, we can share in it. If we're critics and scholars, we can study. This meaning making process is always happening, it's usually happening in your head. We only get the end product when you speak. But when we see it in this riffing act, in this embodied audience, we're seeing it come to life in real time. Really fascinating stuff. So I'd like to close with a couple of quotes here. Um, the first one is from a critical scholar, Umberto Eco. And he says, um, he writes this in an essay called Towards a Semiological Guerrilla Warfare. He says, what must be occupied in every part of the world is the first chair in front of every team. The battle for survival of man is, as a responsible being in the communications era is not one where the communication originates, but where it arrives. Meaning, we no longer care. Have you ever heard of Roland Barthes' the Death of the Author? Similar thing. We no longer need to concern ourselves about what the people who made the movie intended for us. It only matters what we say. And when we enter into dialogue with other people through this embodied audience, or in other ways as well, we are changing what the text means. We don't need to care about what the George Lucas is and the Stephen the world intended us. Finally, I'd like to close with a quote from Mr. Joel Hobbs. He is the uh, creator of Mystery Science Theater and the founder of this modern movie. He says, quote, jokes are a straight line between a comic and an audience. A riff is a triangle. It's between a person riffing, the screen, and the audience. I love that definition, but I want to change it just a little bit. To me, riffing is a prism. It's got solid sides, audience, setting, uh, text, um, and these different things that he accounted for here. But we also have to account for when, when our ideas hit the prism, they split into a thousand million different directions. So your mind is always doing this complex interpretive work. Um, you're making sense of what you're seeing at a thousand miles an hour all the time. And if you can recognize that, and even better, and start riffing and sharing that with other people, then you realize just how powerful your interpretive mind is. And you now have permission to marvel at your own brain and how amazing just the simple act of watching a movie and a television show is. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you.